My cells and your cells are always busy and so need a lot of energy. To provide this energy, our cells have special structures called mitochondria. But where did these structures evolve from? The answer is actually very cool. Let's find out more, shall we? I make a new science video each week, so if you enjoy these videos, then please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. First of all, we need to think about different types of cells. There are two broad groups of cells on Earth. These are called prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are all bacteria. These cells are about one micrometer in diameter, that's about a thousandth of a millimeter. On the inside of these cells, they have DNA. But instead of being in the form of chromosomes in a nucleus, the DNA in prokaryotic cells is in the form of a simple ring in the cell's internal fluid, which is called the cell cytoplasm. These cells are actually quite simple in their structure. Simple, however, doesn't mean worse or bad in any way. Bacteria are phenomenally successful and have been around for billions of years. The other group of cells are called eukaryotic. Our cells and the cells of all animals, plants, fungi and protists are all eukaryotic. These cells are much bigger than bacterial cells. They're between 50 and 500 micrometers. That's between a 20th and half a millimeter in size. So they're much bigger than prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are also much more complex. The DNA in our cells is formed into chromosomes and is found not just floating in the cytoplasm, but in a special structure called the nucleus. Keeping things in specific structures is a much more efficient way of organizing the insides of a cell. Eukaryotic cells have lots of special structures for carrying out specific tasks, such as chloroplasts. Bacteria don't have any of these structures. They don't have chloroplasts or mitochondria. Eukaryotic cells also have other special structures inside them. One of these is the mitochondria that we've already mentioned. All cells require energy in order to function. This energy comes in the form of a molecule called ATP. Mitochondria use oxygen in order to produce large quantities of ATP in a process called aerobic respiration. The mitochondria keep all the enzymes and equipment needed for aerobic respiration in the same place, making the process very efficient. Many bacteria can also respire aerobically, but their enzymes and equipment for doing it is all kept throughout the cells, making it a less efficient process. Think of it a little like this. Imagine you want to make a cake. All the ingredients, your mixing bowl, your weighing scales and your utensils are all kept in the kitchen. So the amount of time you need to spend getting all the different equipment and ingredients is very low. Now imagine that your mixing bowls are kept in one room, your utensils are kept in a separate room, your weighing scales in yet another room, and the ingredients are in a different room. Now in order to bake your cake, you'll need to spend a lot of time traipsing from room to room in order to carry out all the different tasks in order to bake your cake. This would make the process of making a cake much less efficient. This is why mitochondria are useful. It keeps all the enzymes and equipment needed for aerobic respiration together, making it a much more efficient process. Mitochondria have two membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane folded into these structures here called cristae. The cristae hold the enzymes needed for aerobic respiration and these folds increase the surface area of the inner membrane, allowing more enzymes to be located here, again increasing the capacity for aerobic respiration. Inside the inner membrane is a fluid-filled area called the matrix. Bacterial cells developed first, and eukaryotic cells evolved from bacterial cells. So we've learned a little bit about mitochondria, but where did they come from? How did we get from bacteria to eukaryotic cells with these mitochondria inside? The most likely course of evolution that led us to this is that mitochondria were once a different species of bacterial cell that somehow formed a symbiotic relationship with another type of bacterial cell. One bacterial cell engulfs another cell and the two cells now live together in mutual benefit. This relationship is called endosymbiosis. So what evidence is there for this being the case? Well, firstly, bacterial cells are about one micrometer in diameter. 
just as I mentioned at the start of this video. Mitochondria are also about one micrometer in diameter, just like bacterial cells. So mitochondria and bacterial cells are the same size. This however is very weak evidence. Lots of things are the same size as bacterial cells, and that doesn't mean they share a lineage. There is however much more evidence. Let's continue and look at more of it. Next, mitochondria actually have their own DNA. And this contains the code for making proteins that are needed by the mitochondria. And the mitochondrial DNA is not like the DNA found in our cells. It isn't in the form of chromosomes. Instead, this DNA is in the form of a ring, exactly like the DNA in bacterial cells. There's even more evidence to support this. These structures inside cells that do specific jobs are called organelles. And most other organelles are actually made by the cell. There are two exceptions to this, and these are chloroplasts and mitochondria. Mitochondria are only made by other mitochondria. Mitochondria give rise to new mitochondria by dividing. And they also divide in a process called binary fission. This is exactly the same process that bacteria use to multiply themselves. And the two processes are very, very similar. This also involves the replication of mitochondrial DNA, ensuring that each mitochondrion has a copy of the DNA. If you were to remove all the mitochondria from a cell, it would be unable to build new ones from scratch, so cells can only gain mitochondria from having mitochondria. In addition, all cells require structures called ribosomes. The job of ribosomes is to join amino acids together using the instructions from the DNA in order to make proteins. Eukaryotic cells have a particular type of ribosome. The ribosomes in eukaryotic cells are ATS. This ATS stuff just refers to how big the ribosomes are. Prokaryotic cells, on the other hand, have slightly smaller ribosomes. These are 70S ribosomes. Mitochondria also have their own ribosomes that they use to make their own proteins. And what do you know? The ribosomes that mitochondria have are 70S ribosomes, exactly the same type that bacterial cells have. So, is there any evidence against this hypothesis? Well, yes, there is some. Firstly, the membrane surrounding the mitochondria isn't exactly like the membranes that surround bacterial cells. They have a slightly different composition. Also, some mitochondria have linear DNA, not ring-like. This linear mitochondrial DNA is found in some plants, fungi and protists, though the mitochondrial DNA in animal cells is all circular. Also, mitochondrial DNA doesn't contain genes coding for all of the proteins that a mitochondrion needs for all of the processes that it's in charge of. These questions can mainly be answered by pointing to the fact that this relationship has been happening for a couple of billion years and this is plenty of time for them to lose their independence and to change slightly in other ways. The main serious scientific questions regarding the origin of mitochondria centre around the order that events happened. In a kind of a chicken and egg scenario, egg by the way, the serious question is whether eukaryotic cells developed first and then it was these eukaryotic cells that engulfed a bacterial cell that became the mitochondria or was it a prokaryotic cell that engulfed another one and this led to eukaryotic cells with mitochondria? There are even many examples of endosymbiosis evident today throughout the natural world. One such example is that of Paramecium bursaria. This is a single-celled organism and it has a mutualistic relationship with a green algae called Zuclarella. A mutualistic relationship is one where both parties benefit from the relationship. Zuclarella is a photosynthetic organism but has no means of movement. Paramecium bursaria gains food from the relationship provided by the Zuclarella, and Zuclarella gains a certain amount of protection and the ability to move by living inside the Paramecium. So, is endosymbiosis leading to the development of mitochondria, and for that matter chloroplasts, a theory then? Unfortunately, the origins of mitochondria are lost to the mists of time and so it's impossible to test. There's plenty of circumstantial evidence to support this method of mitochondrial genesis, but because it isn't directly testable, we can't really call it a theory at the present time. And maybe we will never be able to test it. 
It is, however, the very most likely origins of mitochondria. So that's all for this trip into evolutionary history, and so for now, thank you for watching.